So yeah, hi everyone, uh, and I'm uh, James Mart, and I'm with Fractally, and um, today we are starting a series of what we uh, hopefully will become a weekly um, a weekly event where we discuss uh, all kinds of stuff related to Sybase, and they could be in the format of uh, lectures or talks and discussions, interviews, uh, technical code walkthroughs really all kinds of material, but uh, yeah, we hope that it could be educational and interesting, might attract people to our uh, mission who have similar interests and understanding. Um, I, I guess I'll make a, a, a disclaimer that I hope is obvious, but that anything that I say is really my own opinion. It's my, it's my own position. It doesn't necessarily reflect the position of like fractally the company. Um, and this First talk is not really going to be about Sybase or fractal governance um, or any of the other things you might have heard the fractally team talk about in the past. This is really about uh, fundamentally and philosophically, like what is um, blockchain and why is it relevant? Uh, and that's relevant to Sybase because Sybase includes a blockchain. It's our own blockchain architecture. Um, yeah, and that question seems like an approachable question. I've definitely been asked that question at parties, uh, and I've never really known exactly what to say. And um, because first of all, it's a complicated topic. It's a deep topic about what what is blockchain and why is it relevant. Um, and also, I think to be quite honest, there's a lot of intuition that goes into uh, caring about blockchain and understanding blockchain. So it, it's maybe difficult to get at the underlying principles of what justifies that intuition. Um, and so that's the work I've tried to do, and I'll try to relay here. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I have one more caveat and a source I want to cite, and then, and then I'll get started. The, the final caveat is that um, when I'd say blockchain, that can mean a million different things to a million different people. Uh, it's not just one thing. So yeah, if I if I say something and I, I attribute some quality to blockchain, I'm quite certain you can find a blockchain that for which that's not relevant. Um, and so I'm going to try to stick mostly to making like talking about things that are broadly relevant and widely accepted as applicable to most public blockchain networks. Um, the source I want to cite is the Meeting of Decentralization, which is an article by Vitalik Buterin uh, that I uh, I use those definitions. I don't know if he made those definitions or what, but that's where I first read the definitions of decentralization that he proposes there, and I find them to be highly clarifying. So that is my uh, source for the definitions of decentralization that I use throughout this talk. Um, so I think that's it. And... Yeah, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna jump into it then. So what what is blockchain and why why is blockchain relevant? Um, I want to start by talking about uh, competition. And competition is obviously really great at a lot of things, namely optimization. So if there's a particular quality that a system should optimize for, often profit, uh, a market will maximize efficiency, it'll bring down costs. That's all true, all the traditional benefits you, you can get from markets and competition. Um, the issue is that pure free markets are so good at optimizing that whenever other values come into conflict with whatever is being optimized, then those values are sacrificed. That is the incentive structure of a market. If you don't sacrifice something that's causing you to be less competitive, uh, then generally you're outcompeted and you go extinct. So there's just a natural selection process going on. And we're left with those players who are willing to truly maximize their competitiveness by whatever means. Um, and markets are everywhere. And I would argue that there are often times when the quality we optimize for in a market does not fully capture what we want to optimize for. And 
that disparity can sometimes have serious consequences. For example, uh, take elections. Uh, elections are effectively a marketplace where we're competing for electability. And electability at first glance seems like it represents how much people like and trust the candidate and their policies. Um, but in reality, this is an optimization problem. And as such, we're left with hand-drawn electoral districts that effectively, effectively reduce the value of our votes and we're massive corporate welfare budgets. And um, because to come out against corporate welfare means you lose the donations and lobbying support of those corporations. And, um, you know, that's just a simple example of an optimization problem gone wrong. Uh, but so many of the things that you might identify as bad outcomes or misuses of capital at the scale of government, like elections in my example, or at the scale of your local community or online and social networks um, or wherever are in fact, not the result of design, I think. They're, these bad outcomes, I think, emerge from the incentive structure. And if you're not careful with the incentive structure design, then you lead well-intentioned people to make rational decisions that are worse for everyone, including themselves. Uh, and so uh, to drive this point home, I want to read an excerpt from uh, Meditations on Moloch by Scott Alexander, um, which by the way, is an article I would encourage everyone to read if you haven't. Um, but here it is. Uh, Just as you can look at an arid terrain and determine what shape a river will one day take by assuming water will obey gravity, so you can look at a civilization and determine what shape its institutions will one day take by assuming people will obey incentives. If you've never been to Las Vegas, it is really impressive. Skyscrapers and lights in every variety, strange and beautiful, all clustered together. It is glorious that we can create something like this. It is shameful that we did. By what standard is building gigantic 40-story high indoor replicas of Venice, Paris, Rome, Egypt, and Camelot side by side, filled with albino tigers in the middle of the most inhospitable desert in North America, a remotely sane use of our civilization's limited resources. Las Vegas doesn't exist because of some decision to hedonically optimize civilization. It exists because of a quirk in dopaminergic reward circuits, plus the microstructure of an uneven regulatory environment, plus shelling points. Just as the course of a river is latent in a terrain even before the first rain falls on it, so the existence of Caesar's palace was latent in neurobiology, economics, and regulatory regimes even before it existed. The entrepreneur who built it was just filling in the ghostly lines with real concrete. So we have all this amazing technological and cognitive energy, the brilliance of the human species, wasted on reciting the lines written by poorly evolved cellular receptors and blind economics, like gods being ordered around by a moron. That's the quote. Um, and James, give us the name of the author and book again. Yeah, Scott Alexander. It's it's an online article called Meditations on Moloch, which is a, a, a poem. Um, and uh, yeah, I would definitely encourage. It's a bit long, but it's, I would say, highly worth reading. Um, yeah, I love how he he paints that picture of uh, an entrepreneur filling in the ghostly lines of Caesar's palace with real concrete. And um, I think he's right. The incentive structures all around us can be used to determine what, given enough time, they will turn each of our institutions into. Um, so digital advertising incentivizes violations of online privacy. Pharmaceutical companies make money selling drugs to address illness rather than eliminating it. Uh, lawyers who write contracts benefit from frivolous lawsuits and complicated laws. Um, I mean, yeah, doesn't it seem obvious that everyone would benefit from agreeing with everyone else to just delete their nuclear weapons? <laughs> but without uh, perfect or nearly perfect coordination, any state actor within the current system has to assume that others are not disarming themselves and thus to do so would be a competitive competitive disadvantage. And so our race to fill the earth with ever more potentially civilization ending weapons continues. Uh, so I hope you get what I'm talking about when I say bad incentives and their outcomes. Um, 
And actually, even if you disagree with any particular case I've mentioned, um, what is true regardless is that wherever bad incentives exist, they at least undermine the credibility of that system and they cause a breakdown in trust. Um, and that is itself a big deal. Trust really is necessary for cooperation. So um, what can be done about bad incentives? Uh, historically, the main solution uh, is some kind of government regulation. Uh, and in a way, I would say that's exactly right. Um, what it acknowledges in general is that you need people to use some kind of coordination structure like the government in order to implement measures to counter the natural market incentives that so often sacrifice our other values. Um, but the reason so many people vomit in their mouths at solutions that involve government intervention is largely because they've lost trust in the credibility of the government institutions. And that I think is in large part due to the obvious existence of perverse incentives in its very structure. Um, and my argument is not going to be here that government is somehow bad. In fact, I hope you'll actually see that the intentions of government are something I highly align with. Um, my argument is just that blockchain technology really can help us here. So to understand why um, I want to dive fairly deep into the fundamentals of blockchain and economics. Um, yeah, so uh, you might relate to blockchain as a technology that enables like investors to uh, invest in fake internet money or um, scammers to scam people. Uh, many engineers even, uh, maybe particularly engineers and even those who've been in the industry for a long time seem to have come to more or less consider blockchains to be just a, a new distributed database technology. Um, but is that right? Is it just, in fact, a boring old database? <laughs> um, more of the same. Uh, well, a blockchain, a database holds data, right? And a blockchain holds data. So a blockchain is a database, but it is a database that is replicated among many computers. So you could say it's a distributed database. But I argue that just as it would be uninteresting to describe a human as just a collection of atoms, uh, so too, I think it would be reductionistic and uninteresting to describe blockchain networks as just distributed databases. It's the properties of the whole network that have ignited the collective excitement of computer scientists and economists and cryptographers around the world. Uh, so what are those properties? Um, one interesting property of a public blockchain network is that no single computer in that distributed database is privileged and controls the data. So there is therefore no single computer for a hacker to target or that could go down disrupting access. We call this architectural decentralization because there's no center to the physical architecture. And architectural decentralization like this makes blockchains resistant to being shut down. So digital currencies where you want the highest of reliability guarantees are a natural application. Um, but many people intuitively, especially at first, are highly skeptical about um, the thought of a currency that's not controlled by or really in any way related to a government. I And I think that's for a good reason. Um, like, why is that? So think about it. Why can't you issue your own currency? Um, there's many practical reasons, right? You might not know how. Uh, it's also illegal <laughs> in the US. Um, but Besides all of that, uh, you could in principle create one. And the problem I suspect you'd come across is that no one will trust it. No one wants to trust a currency, the thing that's tokenizing the value that they earn by doing some work. Nobody wants to entrust that to you um, or really to any person or company. So 
And digital currency is just one type of digital property. Um, and property has that same issue. Like my property is my land, right? Or my house. Um, and the government will back me up on that. But my Facebook profile, um, <laughs> yeah, we know that if Facebook goes down, my profile is gone. So it isn't really my digital property in the same way as my physical property, like my watch or my cup here or something. Um, so I hope to show you that blockchains give us this ability to have real digital property that has the same quality we want in real life property and real life currency, where we're not just entrusting it to a single person or company. Uh, and to understand how, uh, I want to look at how real life property works. How is it assigned? To our pre-modern ancestors, property was assigned with some unwritten rules, like I made this or I got here first. Um, but in a dispute, uh, the, the real right to the property essentially came down to the law of the jungle, right? Or the use of force with the victor assuming ownership of the property. Um, today, we have delegated the use of force to the state. So in a dispute, we delegate the final opinion on the right to any particular property to the courts uh, or to the state. But why do we believe that the state is justified to secure our property rights? What if the opinion of the state is by tomorrow that my house ought to be taken from me for some reason that I find illegitimate? Uh, well, in some parts of the world, uh, that's still a real concern. But in the United States, the reason we can sleep at night without that particular fear uh, is that the opinion of the state is not just the arbitrary opinion of any one person. It is the it is a process of reaching consensus, right, between many parties with their own policies and priorities from which the opinion of the state emerges. And anyone in principle can work to get involved and influence the policies that emerge from that system. This quality that I'm describing is something that in the blockchain industry we call political decentralization, and it's extremely important. Um, and to be clear, I'm, I'm saying that the form of government we have in the United States is intended to have a politically decentralized process, not that the outcome or representatives or any policies are in any way neutral or unbiased or decentralized or something. I'm, I'm saying the process itself of election and representation and checks and balances and the whole thing, that is itself not intended to have any political bias. Um, and anyone in theory can participate and run for office. That is political decentralization. And that quality is what I'm arguing justifies a system as a credible basis for establishing property rights. You need to be confident in the neutrality of that system that secures your property. So. Uh, a blockchain, more or less, uh, depending on the blockchain in question, has that property. Um, so no, we're not talking about just the distributed database, but crucially also the protocol used to maintain that database. And that protocol emerges from the consensus of all participants in the network. And anyone, in theory, can participate and run a node for a blockchain. So by definition, it it is politically decentralized and can therefore be used to secure digital property. And that is, first of all, fundamentally cool, if you ask me. Um, I would not have expected uh, that we would figure out a way to have total strangers who don't implicitly trust each other uh, be able to collaborate and build a database that can be sufficiently neutral so as to hold digital property. Um, and there's a few extra cool things uh, I'll mention about this. First of all, theft is, in a sense, impossible um, with this type of digital property. I mean, in physical reality, it, even if I don't have the keys to your house, I could still break a window and steal your property. Um, but in a blockchain network, if I can get your digital keys, then and only then can I steal your digital property. So there's no window to break. So for the first time in human history, we can have an unbreakable right to a form of property, in this case, digital property. And another cool thing is that even though 
all this data on a blockchain is stored by uh, hundreds or thousands of different people and companies, it can be accessed and used uh, in a way that feels like you're interacting with a single shared database. So rather than today's status quo where Facebook data lives on Facebook and Twitter data lives on Twitter, uh, data and tools that are published on blockchains um, by one person are accessible and usable by everyone else. And that's called composability to app developers. And I have no idea how people are going to leverage this increased composability, but it is just another fundamental capability that blockchain networks enable. Okay, so to recap what I've talked about so far, um, blockchains are distributed databases. This makes them resilient to hacks and ensures the data remains accessible. They're intended to be open to anyone uh, to contribute to produce the protocol by which people interact and store data and digital property. Um, theft of that property is in a way impossible and they also increase composability, which enables new forms of collaboration. But perhaps some of you are now wondering how any of this is relevant to the problem I described at the beginning of bad incentives. And that is a good question. Uh, but if you understand how blockchains can secure property, I think you're actually most of the way there. So I'm going to talk quickly about uh, the concept of value and tokens, and then I'm going to try to pull all the pieces together here. Um, James, did you, uh, I forgot to ask at the beginning, did you want to take any yeah. Q&A you know, in between as you go interstitially or only at the end? Um, let, let's do it at the end. I'll do a I'll try my best to to pull these pieces together and then hopefully by doing so eliminate some of the questions. Um, cool. And then, yeah. Um, so on, on value, on the concept of value and tokens, um, gold is useful for conducting electricity. Um, and so it's used in various circuitry. Uh, but its market value far exceeds what you would expect purely based on that utility. So similarly, blockchain network tokens are, are useful. They're used to prevent spam uh, on the blockchains that issue them, uh, but their market value often far exceeds what you would expect purely based on that utility. Um, and one of the reasons people value gold, albeit rather circular, is that they consider gold to be a store of value um, or in other words, they value it because they expect that other people value it and will continue to value it. Uh, and so similarly, if I find a token uh, that has utility that I think is valuable and that token has a fair distribution on some blockchain, it's not crazy to value those tokens. And what I'm not saying here is that like the market value is fair for any particular token, but I'm saying that you can have confidence that the network and therefore the token's utility are going to persist long-term because of that architectural decentralization I talked about. And furthermore, you can have confidence that that distribution is going to remain fair. Why? Well, first of all, because of the political decentralization. Um, so the distribution the distribution rules are not easy to change. Um, it could only change if the consensus of all the operators changed, but it's it's actually also more than that. It's um, There's an incentive aspect to it. Like imagine if it did change and that the operators all decide to change the protocol to their own benefit. Um, they mint a bunch of tokens to themselves. <laughs> that would just undermine trust in the value of those tokens and subsequently undermine the wealth of the very people who are trying to game the system. Um, and that sounds like some economic theory or theorizing, but it really isn't anymore. That It is in this way, through this incentive mechanism, that Bitcoin has grown to the absolute giant it is today without ever changing the fundamental monetary properties with which it was created almost a decade and a half ago. Um, so if blockchains are useful, uh, they can store property and can facilitate the distribution, ownership, and transfer of value 
<clears throat> What's the conclusion? A blockchain is a market. It's a competition for people to optimize for something, meaning they're coordinating to do the thing and proportionally receiving value according to some rules, some incentive structure. And there are literally thousands of ongoing experiments where blockchain networks are being formed for all kinds of reasons and to store and transfer all kinds of data and digital property. And they all have slightly different incentive structures. And we get to simply watch and discover those networks that make the best trade-offs and optimize for the most efficient coordination. It is kind of like a competition competition or a market of markets. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's not really that a particular blockchain is what excites me. It's if you see this entire space from the 10,000 foot view, I, I see it as this giant sandbox for various competing coordination protocols. And if you don't happen to see a blockchain network that in your view makes coordination way more efficient, that's fine. To be excited, you don't have to see the final solution. It, in fact, almost certainly doesn't exist yet. Um, you just have to see the natural selection process going on that is eliminating the networks that make unstable trade-offs and surfacing the protocols that are the most successful and resilient. So over time, we can integrate these ever improving mechanisms into various industries and organizations and store our digital property and manage our digital value. We gain transparency, more resiliency, more integrity, better ways to allocate the value produced by society. We will get much better at coordinating and coordinating the distribution of that value. Coordinate, recall that coordination is the thing that breaks us out of those Malthusian bad incentive traps. Um, so ultimately, I think that we can build societies that better respect the consensus of actual people and not just the emergent will of blind economics and incentives. I see blockchain technology as exactly that glimmer of hope that we can turn competition on itself to eliminate structural corruption and bias and increase credibility and trust and cooperation. And crucially, all of this without violent revolution. Um, so that to me is exactly why blockchain. And that's also why I don't have a good short answer at parties. Uh, so that's all I got. And uh, yeah, if there's questions or comments or...